some of what I'm going to talk about today will be difficult to hear. Some of it may be difficult to digest. Some of it may be difficult even to believe. But I can sure assure you that everything we're going to speak about today is true. It's painfully true. It's disgustingly true. September 14, 2023, at a hearing in this very building, Assistant Secretary of State Yuri Kim testified, and I'm quoting, the United States will not countenance any action or effort to ethnically cleanse or commit other atrocities against the Armenian population of Nagorno-Karabakh. Five days later, Azerbaijan ethnically cleansed the entire Armenian population of Nagorno-Karabakh. Secretary Blinken then tweeted from Turkey that he was discussing, and I'm quoting again here, the situation in Nagorno-Karabakh and finalizing Swedish accession to NATO with the Turkish foreign minister. In troubling lockstep, the New York Times, who for 286 days refused to publish anything material on the Artsakh blockade, was suddenly awakened. Nobody saw it coming, was the headline. Really? Nobody saw it coming? Perhaps the New York Times missed the official government stamp issued by Azerbaijan depicting an exterminator in a hazmat suit actually cleansing Nagorno-Karabakh of Armenians. Or perhaps Ambassador Kim missed that military trophy park in Baku, proudly showcasing the helmets of fallen Armenian soldiers, gruesome and bloody mannequins of Armenians displayed in a public park for Azerbaijani children to mock and degrade. In fact, at the time of Ambassador Kim's testimony, Azerbaijan had already circulated videos of Armenian captives crawling on their hands and knees while being prodded like animals by Azerbaijani soldiers with metal pipes. Armenian children had already been beheaded by Azerbaijani drone fire. Armenian women were being marketed for rape on Azerbaijani social media channels. At the time of her testimony, the president of Azerbaijan in this century, a century after the first genocide of the Armenians, was referring to Armenians, to some of you here, as dogs. Azerbaijani politicians were calling Armenians cancers, tumors, rats. Nobody saw it coming. Nobody thought that maybe Azerbaijan was preparing to exterminate the Artsakh Armenians like rats, chase them out like dogs, cut them out like cancers. Nobody? Azerbaijan had also circulated images of Armenian POWs bound and brought to their knees as Azerbaijani soldiers in a sickening euphoria unloaded bullet after bullet into the heads and backs of young Armenian boys, teenagers, boys barely in their 20s. And Armenian women were not only targeted for rape, her body was mutilated. Turkish words chiseled into her bare and exposed chest. Her eyes gouged out. Stones jammed into her eye sockets in their place. Her fingers were chopped off and shoved into her mouth. 
a young Armenian mother, not much older than many of you here. Nobody saw it coming. What did they think was going to happen? as the Azerbaijani army completely encircled Artsakh, starved actual human beings to death and submission, cut off cities, shot families, shot farmers, cut gas, electricity, and denied them water for 286 days. Children and churches, languages and livelihoods, families and freedoms, all degraded, desecrated, demeaned, destroyed. This is not never again. This is not never again at all. One nation, two genocides, one century. This is a national catastrophe of epic proportion. Epic proportion. So how in the world did we get to this moment? This is what I want to talk to you about today. And I want to talk to you about it here in DC. Because the reason Armenians became that nation has as much to do with certain people here in Washington as it has to do with those planning and committing genocide half a world away. The genocide of the Artsakh Armenians was not by accident, not at all. You know, in Ephesians 5.11, Paul instructs that one should, quote, have no fellowship with the fruitless deeds of darkness, but rather expose them. So here we go. It shocked me when policymakers and think tanks in Washington and Brussels started suggesting at the end of the 2020 war that the best outcome for Nagorno-Karabakh would be some sort of integration or protected status within Azerbaijan. This was a narrative de developed and sold by policymakers here in Washington and in Brussels as a settlement, sorry, a dignified settlement to the Nagorno-Karabakh crisis. And the story went like this. Artsakh Armenians would be given certain rights and protections to live peacefully within Azerbaijan. And thus, Azerbaijan's territorial integrity would be respected, and Armenians would continue to live in, uh, in safety and with dignity in their homeland. You may remember some of this language. The international community told Yerevan that if they would just lower the bar on Artsakh, and speak about the Artsakh Armenians from the perspective of minority rights. Not as a people with the right to self-determination, but as a minority. Then by some geopolitical magic, the seas would part, peace would reign, and the global world order would find a beautiful equilibrium in which all peoples of the region would flourish. In fact, Talking heads paid for by Brussels and Washington even tried to convince Armenians that the Artsakh Armenians could live under Azerbaijani authority, that coexistence under their rule was possible. This was a false narrative. The administration here was advocating to place Armenians under the control and authority of Azerbaijan right at the time when Genocide Watch had raised the genocide threat level facing the Artsakh Armenians to levels 9 and 10. When the Lemkin Institute for Genocide Prevention had warned that Azerbaijan's actions, and I'm quoting here, are part of a larger genocidal pattern demonstrating Azerbaijan's armenophobia and genocidal intent aimed at the eradication of Armenia, Artsakh, and the Armenians. In that documented reality, the solution being pandered by sophisticated parties right here in DC and being pushed on the Armenian authorities in Yerevan was to actually place Artsakh Armenians within Azerbaijan? That's a workable solution for the fate of actual human beings? 
Azerbaijan instituted the blockade. But still, Washington and Brussels kept pushing the narrative. The integration narrative just went on? Integration when 100,000 Armenians remained under a total blockade by Azerbaijan for more than nine months. Integration when Azerbaijan was seeking to completely isolate, encircle, and starve actual human beings. Washington's solution was to push Artsakh Armenians under the authority and control of a regime intent on destroying them? That we even allowed this narrative is appalling. It's ungodly. We would never imagine subjecting a population of 100,000 Jews to the authority of a rabid Nazi regime, or any Nazi regime for that matter. Let's give it another try? That would not only be an utterly ridiculous proposition, it would be patently inhumane, intellectually vapid, morally bankrupt, and it's disgusting to even imagine. The same is true here. You know, there's a reason why Armenians have a natural aversion to the thought of being subjected to the authority of the Baku regime. Actually, there's a number of reasons. Shushi, Baku, Sumgait, Kirovabad, Maraha, Nahichevan, all of them brutal massacres, all of them ethnic cleansing of Armenians by Azerbaijan. Make no mistake, Aliyev is a fascist. He's a dictator cultivating a society committed to destroying the Armenian nation. And this is not hyperbole. Aliyev said it himself. We will destroy you, he told the Armenian prime minister. And he's not done. Just over a year ago, Aliyev announced the creation of the Goicha Zangezur Republic. Ever heard of that one? That's a new republic spanning from Gyumri to Sunik in Armenia. And before you laugh it off as something silly, think about this. Azerbaijani soldiers carry maps of this new republic in their pockets. And Yerevan, the capital of Armenia, is on those maps. Unrealistic? Aliyev has people parading around in Brussels and Geneva, advocating for what he calls Western Azerbaijan. That's the name he uses for Armenia. And Aliyev has friends in this campaign. Erdogan stood next to Aliyev at a military parade in Baku and openly praised Nuri Pasha, the Ottoman leader who executed the eastern flank of the Armenian genocide a century ago. The message was clear, at least to the Armenians. So Armenia insisted on international mechanisms, on international protection for the Armenians under siege in Artsakh. Don't worry, this administration told Yerevan. We'll make sure that the Artsakh Armenians have security guarantees, perhaps even a protected status within Azerbaijan. This was a colossal sham. What demented legal framework would allow or even condone pushing a targeted population into the military and political authority of the perpetrator seeking to exterminate them? That would be absurd as a legal principle. Absolutely absurd. It would make no sense. Except, of course, if there's no genocidal perpetrator. And that takes us back to Ambassador Kim's congressional testimony. Let's pretend there's no genocide. Let's pretend we don't know what Aliyev is planning. Better yet, let's pretend that we would, we would never even countenance it. You see, if we never name the perpetrator who is starving an entire people to death under threat of force, if we don't use the word genocide and pretend it's not happening, then we can continue to push Azerbaijan's integration policy. But there's a rub. Pretending there's no genocidal intent is, well, it's just pretending. 
And if you're pushing for integration where there is genocidal intent, man, you're kind of helping Aliyev commit genocide, aren't you? You're literally helping serve up the victim. There's a word in international criminal law that describes this kind of helping to commit genocide. It's called complicity, and it's really illegal. This is why when Ambassador Kim was asked in a congressional hearing about why she thought, why she thought Aliyev was not lifting the blockade, she chose not to respond, asking the senator for another setting. You see, knowledge of Aliyev's intent is a liability. Washington was advocating for the integration of Artsakh Armenians into Azerbaijan, while Azerbaijan had already engaged and was actively engaged right then, at that very moment, in the ethnic cleansing of Artsakh Armenians. The blockade itself is evidence of that campaign. But the backstory, the backstory is unavoidable too. Azerbaijan had already and has already ethnically cleansed Armenians from every city that has fallen under its authority and control. It even labors to cleanse the land itself of any evidence of Christian Armenians, destroying Armenian churches, unearthing entire Armenian cemeteries, scraping away ancient biblical inscriptions, and claiming that Armenian churches are actually Albanian churches. And as Simon's rather frightening discovery just, just published demonstrates, Azerbaijan may have been building concentration camps to house the integrated, integrated Artsakh Armenians. Aliyev's integration agenda is and was Aliyev's genocide agenda. Human mutilation, child beheadings, rape, and human indignities, dehumanization, starvation, isolation, concentration camps, and the destruction of cultural and religious heritage, these aren't the hallmarks of an integration plan. These are the markers of another plan altogether. Let's just not say it publicly, Ambassador Kim. And just to be clear, and this is important from a geopolitical sense, the administration can't hide behind Azerbaijan's claim of territorial integrity. Not here. Territorial integrity is not a license to destroy a people, whether you claim they are your citizens or not. A state's territorial integrity is not a license to commit genocide or ethnically cleanse the people from their homeland, even if you believe that homeland is inside what you think are your borders. That's the equivalent of saying that as long as you're murdering and raping the people in your house, well, hey, it's your own house. This is Azerbaijan's territorial integrity argument in a nutshell. Territorial integrity is not some inviolable sacred right. Under international law, it's not supreme to the right of self-determination. It's not even on par with the law of self-determination. Territorial integrity is an operational rule. It's part of the rules of the road of the international community, a UN charter rule. And I'm going to explain what this means in closing. Take, for example, the speed limit, 35 miles an hour. That's the rule. The rule should be followed. It should be followed by everybody. Yes, it should be followed at night and during the day, on weekends and weekdays, always. Right? Except that's not true, is it? When you're rushing a dying relative to the hospital, the speed limit doesn't matter, does it? When you're driving your child away from a school shooting, the speed limit doesn't matter, does it? Cars pull over for the ambulance. Police even escort you as you speed through the streets and school, school zones. Suddenly, it's not about the speed limit anymore, but the life that you're trying to save. The speed limit is the rule, yes, until there is a life-threatening emergency, a more important life-saving purpose. Then the speed limit is not only meaningless, 
it's purposely and completely cast aside to save human life. Territorial integrity is the speed limit under international law. It's one of the rules of the road. But when a state is intentionally seeking to destroy human beings, a 4,000-year-old civilization from its roots, after launching a 44-day war, murdering thousands, blockading them for 10 months, starving them and isolating them from the world, and then attacking them again with shells and ground forces, 100,000 people in complete siege at risk of death and displacement at the, barest, at the barrel of a fascist military intent on committing war crimes and atrocities? Well, that's an emergency. That's when the speed limit doesn't matter anymore. That's when cars pull over for the ambulance. That's when you get to speed at 100 miles per hour in a school zone. When the intent to commit genocide, when acts of genocide are underway, and they're still underway right now, it is the right of return and self-determination that is required. The Artsakh Armenians are entitled to the right of return to their Christian homeland, to their churches, to their homes, to their cathedrals, to their orchards, and to their mountains. And given Aliyev's genocidal intent, they are entitled to return to their homeland under international protection, not to be pushed naked into the clutches of the very dictatorship working to destroy them. The administration got this wrong completely wrong. And the real consequences are yet to play out. And when they do, they will be violent, dreadful, and shocking still for the oldest Christian nation on earth, the last true bastion of Christianity in the Middle East. You know, Proverbs 24.11 instructs that we must rescue those who are being taken away to death. Hold back those who are stumbling to the slaughter. Perhaps the next U.S. administration will heed its wisdom. Thank you.